Welcome to the Tanya Acker Show. Zaman Qureshi is here with me today. He is one of the co-founders of Design It For Us. That's an organization that is focused on making the internet and social media platforms a better and safer experience for young people. Zaman is also the youngest person ever to file a lawsuit against the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission. It's related to his digital advocacy and activism. I'll let him tell you about that. He is a senior in college and he's doing all of these things. Uh, He is a remarkable, uh, dynamic human being. And I'm glad that you are here to listen to my conversation uh, with him. Thank you for being here. Don't forget to subscribe. Here I am with Zaman Qureshi. Welcome to the podcast, Zaman. You are a co-founder of Design It For Us. Tell us what that is and what kind of work you're doing. Hi, Tanya. Thanks so much for having me on. So Design It For Us is a coalition of youth activists driving state and federal policy to protect kids and teens online. What that really means is we've seen a social media landscape where we as a generation have been raised as guinea pigs on these platforms And it's time for us to take some ownership and control over what the future looks like for us. We see that as pushing legislation and policy as a solution to that problem. When you say you feel your generation has been treated as guinea pigs, explain what you mean by that. Because it's true, you're really the first group of folks who grew up in what I think might be described as a primarily digital social world, right? Like, (laughs) I'm not telling you my age. I'm not ashamed of it. (laughs) But, um, you know, we learned it. Like, when I was your age, there were other ways of engaging. I've learned how to engage with these platforms. You know, I think millennials, you know, they grew up with more of it, certainly, than I did. But your generation, you know, the, the Gen Zers, it's really kind of all encompassing. So with that said, uh, I'll repeat my question. Why guinea pigs? What does that mean to you? How do you want us to, how do you want us to understand that? I think there's no better place to look right now than the uh, lawsuit that has been filed by a number of states against Facebook. 42 states have sued Meta and Instagram for claiming uh, essentially that the company knew that its products were harmful and addictive to kids and teens and that it continued to push um, product features and changes knowing that they needed to hook a generation if they were going to continue to remain profitable with the next generation. Really, that's what I mean by guinea pigs in that if you go through some of these lawsuits, the attorneys general across the country are basically documenting time and again when Facebook and Instagram made decisions inside the company to experiment on kids and teens. And so I think stories is a great example. So like Instagram stories, we're all familiar with like the little circles that started to appear at the top of our Instagram feed a couple of years ago. Facebook internal research shows that teens, particularly in college and high school, were more drawn to stories because they were worried about missing out, about uh, disappearing stories after 24 hours. And so Instagram knew if they could heighten that feature a bit and like tweak it to kids and teens, that they would be able to keep kids and teens scrolling on the platform longer. Because let's face it, like our generation doesn't really use Facebook, like the Facebook blue app that much. And so they knew that like, we need to gear our product a little bit more so we can hit this audience, this generation. It just came at the expense of our mental health and our well-being and unfortunately our social connections as well, which have been so uh, digitally ingrained. Talk about what that harm means because... You know, there's an argument to be made that young people are a great audience. You all are wonderful consumers. So why shouldn't marketers say, hey, uh, I want to really grab the attention of young people? What are the harms that these sort of auto-scrolling and, you know, what are the specific harms to young people um, that you think these technologies result in? 
Yeah, I, I think it's a great question. And I think that Design It For Us as an organization has t- tried to draw what we think is a, is a really important line in this conversation. So we see the, the way that we discuss these issues as, you know, we as a generation have grown up almost entirely online. And there has been a lot of good that has come from social media and our ability to connect with our generation, with people from around the world that we might not have ever met to understand culture and music and whatever the the thing might be that social media is able to do. That's been great. And I think that technology companies can definitely pat themselves on the back for and say, we have revolutionized the way that we've connected the world. But the darker side to this coin is about the time spent on on these platforms that have been negative experiences. And these negative experiences range. I think there's definitely the majority of experiences amongst my generation. The thing I hear the most is like people are just like, I'm spending too much time on my phone. I'm spending too much time on social media. I know I want to be doing the in-person things more. I know I crave that like in-person social connection, but I just feel stuck. And I think that's like a, a, a broad range of Gen Z. If you ask any young person who's online or uses social media, will probably like have some version of that story at one point in their life. But I think where it gets even more problematic after that is where we're thinking about the ways that really negative content um, has been amplified by addictive algorithms. And so this is where we sort of start to get into the conversation around mental health. So eating disorders, depression, anxiety, suicide, connected to um, child predators. These are the ways in which social media is tools have been harnessed by either bad actors or the ways that the actual algorithms have been programmed such that like a young person who is experiencing, you know, self-esteem issues with their body are being targeted with content over and over that pushes them towards an eating disorder. And I think there's documented cases that have come forward more and more over these past couple of years that point to that. I think that if you spend any amount of time on social media, um, I certainly do, uh, you do get these images uh, that are sort of fed to you that really feed on themselves, you know, sort of snowballs. So if you are looking for vitamins, then you start seeing vitamin ads. If you are looking to lose weight, you start seeing weight loss ads. And when I think about what the impact of some of that might be on a younger person um, who's more impressionable, who's seeing images that, hi, by the way, in many cases are not real. Um, There are all sorts of filters, like you're looking at these filtered images. And, you know, I think for um, young people in particular, I was going to say young women, but I think it's young men, young people um, across the board who are being spoon fed, unrealistic, photoshopped, completely unreal notions of what they should look like, of what beauty is, um, of what one uh, should uh, do to, to be and remain attractive. And I think that it's, um, it's not hard to see how that can work on a, a young mind. You, though, uh, put your action and time uh, where your mouth is uh, and helped pass legislation uh, in order to, uh, to to remedy some of these detrimental impacts. Tell us about the California age-appropriate design code. And by the way, congratulations. You haven't even graduated from college, uh, and you're already getting bills passed. So I see a big future. Um, tell us about this bill that you were so instrumental in getting through. No, thank you. I appreciate it. And I, I, I definitely agree with, with everything that you've said so far. Really what we saw with the the age-appropriate design code, and and Design It For Us was formed as a campaign initially to pass the age-appropriate design code. We've since become a coalition following that. The age-appropriate design code looked at a set of problems around the algorithmic amplification of content, of negative and harmful content, and addictive design features, and said rather than tackling the bad stuff 
that young people are seeing on social media. Let's tackle the bad tools that are amplifying that kind of content to younger people. And so not only did that kind of get around the sort of free speech arguments that we often hear in, in this country around regulating social media, but it got down to the core of the business model of social media, which is the more data collected on you and I trains an algorithm to better promote a, uh, to better promote content to us. And thus we spend more time on the platform, but researchers inside these companies know that the more incendiary, the more hateful, the more perverse the piece of content is, the more likely we're going to spend time on the platform. And so if we can kind of decouple that business model where they're not able to collect endless amounts of, in of information on us, or they're able, we as users have the choice to be able to disable certain features so we can stop scrolling as much as we are. This is kind of the thought process and the, the ideas that went into the California age appropriate design code. And this has been passed in the UK already. So in, in the United Kingdom, the kids code was passed the year prior. Um, so the California age appropriate design code really takes on a lot of what the UK has done successfully so far. I do have to note that the, the ADC is currently being challenged in a lawsuit by big tech companies who say that either this will be a free speech violation uh, or will be too difficult to implement. But I think what we're hopeful for and what we've seen from the attorney general in California is a real commitment to get this legislation over the line. This legislation passed unanimously through the California state legislature. It will, once implemented, protect all California kids and teens. Some of the provisions in the bill, it would prohibit companies from selling kids personal information. Now, does the act define kids, it's, it's under 13 or under 18? Yeah, so the act kind of breaks it down a little bit. So it, it is under 18. And those under the age of 13 should not be able to access social media because of the existing uh, COPPA framework. So there's a different law passed in 1998, the only law actually that we have on the books for, for federally governing social media companies. Um, and so really what, it, what the age appropriate design code said is we know that technology companies know how old their users are because they're constantly pushing content to us. It's probably a good idea for them to know how old we are. So given that knowledge standard that they know, design a product that's more age appropriate, that's a better experience for your younger users. Because you all know who they are. Now, given that you can tweak certain design changes and stop the collection of user information, this is going to protect younger people in the long term. That's another uh, another uh, feature of the act is that it would prohibit companies from collecting personal information about kids that they don't need uh, to deliver the service. Let's go back to some of those tweaks you just mentioned. Uh, what would they be in your perfect world, which you may be designing one day because you've already done so much? What do those tweaks look like? Yeah, so I think you know, I, I think the best example of this is YouTube's autoplay, for example. So, when you uh, watch a YouTube video, um, immediately, pretty much five seconds afterwards, YouTube already has an idea of what they think you should be watching next. And this is where we see the rabbit hole phenomenon start, where young people are driven into, okay, I'm going to watch this piece of content because I chose to watch it. And then the following pieces of content, there's no kind of active user engagement anymore. It's the passive uh, engagement with the platform that really uh, takes advantage of the more impressionable brain and mind knowing that, oh, another piece of interesting content can come along, but at the detriment of a younger person's attention span and time. That's one of the features. Another is geolocation. To me, I don't see any reason why technology companies should know or be collecting the exact IP addresses and locations of its younger users. We know that these are great in terms of targeting ads to younger users, in terms of serving up new content uh, through an algorithm. But this is exactly the reasons we're talking about because you know, if you know exactly where I am, you can serve me a piece of content given the surroundings that I'm in. 
I think these are some of the things that we want to see really scale back. And I think the, the, there's been a lot of analysis over the past couple of years as well around dark patterns. It's a phenomenon basically where technology companies are creating tools to be able to keep you on the platform longer without you knowing that that's actually happening. So I think stories is a good example of that. Like I said earlier, where you don't actually have the ability to like disable autoplay, for example, or sorry, disable infinite scroll where the stories, if you're on Instagram are just going to keep going until you sign out of the app. Um, and so these are some of the features that I think we want to see kind of regulated a bit more and actually uh, protect its younger users and its user base. And I think that it's important to emphasize that your activism is premised on the impact of these technologies and features on young people. I mean, there is a different impact that that auto scroll feature will have on a young person who's maybe, you know, not doing homework or what have you, than it might on somebody uh, like me, you know, at some point I've got to stop scrolling because I have to go to work, right? Some location features make sense for me because I need driving directions from, you know, point A to point B. Um, If you are 12 or 11, the way that these technologies and features engage with your brain are very different than they uh, that then the impact that they're going to have on my older brain. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, um, definitely. I want to talk about something else you did. Uh, you are the youngest person ever, ever uh, to sue the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission. I am a lawyer by trade. I work on a court show. I don't tend to promote litigation. I think that there's usually a better way, a more efficient way. Um, but I also know that sometimes you just have to do it. That's the business. Uh, the business, you know, before my court show was often in explaining to people why you don't need to go. But sometimes here's when you do. You have a situation where uh, you felt you really did need to sue this government agency and not simply to, uh, to make history by being the youngest person to do so, but for some other reasons. So tell us about your lawsuit. Yeah, Tanya, if I could have avoided court, I absolutely would have. This was about exhausting all of my options. And basically the premise of my lawsuit is that The U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission took a deposition of Mark Zuckerberg back in 2019, but we didn't actually know that that deposition happened until it kind of leaked out in a footnote of a court case in D.C. in 2021. And so what I said is like, this is a government record. The case in which the deposition happened in has wrapped up. The settlement has finished. So why does the public not have access to this deposition? And I put that to the Securities and Exchange Commission in a Freedom of Information Act request. They initially told me that the they could neither confirm nor deny the existence of the document, which I thought was bizarre and preposterous because Facebook had confirmed in court that the document existed. And so I appealed um, just basically on my own, writing an administrative appeal on my own. And the SEC said, yeah, okay, you're right. We will grant you this document. But what transpired over the course of a year was a slow roll by the SEC who continued to go back to Facebook and Meta and decide whether or not uh, what the timeline should be agreed on of when I'm going to be able to get access to this document. It took over a year to get the first release of it. And what I got was a heavily redacted transcript of what Mark Zuckerberg said under oath to the SEC. But what I said and what I ultimately went to our lawyers at Public Citizen, which is a litigation firm in DC, was that these redactions shouldn't stand. I mean, this is in the public interest. And really the bigger, broader picture of the reason I filed this suit is because we've seen time and again, Facebook, this company, this powerful company that was unelected by that, that was elected by nobody the, these powerful executives basically getting to decide how we see content and the way that our social media experience is designed we should know the decisions that they make when it comes to our privacy and our safety 
And so, you know, Mark Zuckerberg has been central and core to so many of the scandals that we've seen around Facebook and Instagram because he's the CEO. The buck stops with him, or so he says. And, you know, what we really saw in this lawsuit, in this uh, deposition, is that Zuckerberg essentially told Congress one thing and then told uh, regulators something else. And that's the piece that everyone saw. Everyone saw him under oath in Congress say one thing and then behind the scenes, you know, he was saying something completely different. That's why I think this is important. And this is a measure for accountability and pushing the needle forward to try and hold these powerful tech executives accountable. What is the status of your lawsuit now? Where does it sit in the process? Yeah, so we're in negotiations with the SEC continuously um, to try and get more redactions removed. We've had another round of redactions removed, and then we're going to have probably another go at it um, fairly soon. We're basically just trying to agree on what information should be allowed to be made public um, because this case is is older and well within the public's interest to be able to learn uh, what Mark Zuckerberg said and when he said it. You're a senior, (laughs) right? (laughs) You're still a senior in college. I just had to double check my notes. So let's just take a step back from the the substance of this incredible work that you're doing. Uh, There are a lot of folks older than you who talk about your generation, and I have sometimes too in the past. (laughs) Thank you for keeping me on my toes. What inspires you? Or rather, what inspired you to say, I don't like the way these technologies are working. I don't like the experience that I and so many other people are having. I want to change it. Oh, also, I believe that the CEO of one of the most powerful companies in the world should be taken to task and held accountable, and I don't think the government should be redacting documents the way that it is. So before I go to class, let me (laughs) um, put together (laughs) this legislation and my my litigation strategy, and then I'm going to go to class. Like, what inspired you to know that you could move levers of power like this? Where do you get that from? Yeah, I I mean, it's a great question. You summed up my uh, day-to-day week perfectly as well. (laughs) Um, You know, I I think I I got a lot of it because I was very kind of politically engaged when I was younger. I worked on the 2018 midterms. I saw, and I worked specifically on a digital campaign, how social media could be used to influence elections. And we won a very contested, close um, house race back in 2018. And and really th- th- from there was the like the fallout of the Cambridge Analytica scandal. And, and what I garnered from that personally was that this tiny British consultancy firm, Cambridge Analytica, um, here in the UK could be used to influence an election in Trinidad, which is where I have ancestry. And really the ability of this firm to have that kind of impact was because of money, because they had the means and the capability to do so. And were essentially able to take advantage of an entire population in a country where democracy and elections are not the most stable. That's where I found a lot of my frustration in the way that these companies um, approached their responsibility and their understanding to the rest of the world. And, and, and to be honest, I mean, I, I have followed in the footsteps of activists and advocates who have made social media activism and big tech accountability mainstream. These are people who I've looked up to, like Carol Cadwallader, the uh, Guardian journalist who broke the Cambridge Analytica story, um, like Jason Kintz uh, from Digital Content Next, who's constantly thinking about the ways in which uh, Facebook is being put to uh, held to, to account in the courts. These are people who have walked the walk for a number of years. And when I was able to finally speak to them and get connected to them when I was younger, Um, it it just kind of activated this spark in me that was like, I can do this as well. I think that's, that's where I find a lot of my grounding 
And then what really ignited me into this work, into this work around protecting my generation, this generation, uh, and really claiming to be able to have a voice for this generation was when the Facebook whistleblower, Frances Haugen, came forward in 2021. She brought forward all this new evidence that really, I think, resonated with a lot of people where we were like, wow, that's us. Those stories, that's us. But when I heard kind of Congress talk about it and the policymakers in D.C., it was devoid of all personal experience and the names and faces to those experiences. And so I set out to kind of be able to put a name to those experiences and those stories, whether it was mine or somebody else's. And knowing that there was going to be more and more young people who felt activated to come to this conversation that's really where I garnered like so much energy and interest into this space and kind of just took it, took it and, and ran with it. I am just beyond, beyond uh, impressed by you, but I think that that's not even quite the right word. Um, I'm inspired by you. Thank you. I, I think you inspire me and you're going to inspire a lot of other people too. Um, what do you do for fun? Um, you know, I love cooking. I love cooking for people. Um, I love football, which I call, which we, in the States is called soccer, but, um, I, I think it's appropriate term is football. Um, I'm a diehard Liverpool fan. And yeah, I mean, beyond that, I think I, I just try and walk my walk. So if I'm talking about the experiences, of people using social media, then it's incumbent on me to get out in the world and meet people and talk to people. And I enjoy exploring and traveling uh, and meeting new people. I am so glad that you were here. I'm so glad in the middle of your busy day uh, between your activism and your uh, speaking truth to power and holding it to uh, taking it to task uh, in our legal system and going to class uh, that you took some time to speak with me. Uh, You really are an inspiration and just a dynamic person. I cannot wait to see what you do next. Call me when you're running. Um, (laughs) (laughs) You know, that's got to be in your future. Uh, Government needs people like you. Uh, Thank you. I appreciate it so much. Thank you. Zaman Qureshi, co-founder of Design It For Us, digital activist and person extraordinaire. Thank you so much for being here. And I do hope you'll come back. Thank you, Tanya. Thanks for having me on. And I will be back.